thank you for coming to our series. We will have one of these the fourth Thursday of every month. Um, there is a spring schedule out. If you didn't get it, we can get you a copy of it if you want to see the different topics. We'd love to have you all come back if you enjoy your time here. Um, Kyle yes. is here very nicely uh, to give a talk today about exercise, nutrition, and sleep in the brain. Um, the Healthy Brain Throughout the Oklahoma series is kind of sponsored or organized by the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study, which is looking at nine and ten or nine and ten year old kids for a ten year study of brain development. Yeah. Um, so we do appreciate you all being here. We hope that your interest in our study and in the research that we're presenting. Sorry. I'm sorry. No, you're no, totally fine. We'll get you some chairs. There's a couple of There's one. Um, that you're all interested and you want to keep coming and if you have any topic ideas or things you would like to hear last fall the last topic we did was essentially questions from the audience so people ask questions over the series or give topic ideas they want to cover and we did an entire talk just on things the audience were interested in learning about so please let us know if there is something you would like to hear about and I will let Kyle give a much better rest of the time <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming. I uh, uh, actually recognize some faces in here, so it's uh, it's good to talk to people I know. Um, uh, yeah, so thanks for coming out, and uh, just to sort of orient everybody, so we're at the Laureate Institute for Brain Research. Can you guys hear me in the back? Kinda? Okay. I'll talk softer. And, um, <laughs> joke, sorry, I'll talk louder. Um, so we're at the Laureate Institute for Brain Research, uh, which is a neuroscience institute that's devoted to understanding the neural basis of psychiatric illness. Uh, it's been very uh, generously uh, funded by the William K. Warren Foundation. And uh, you know, the primary technology that we use here to study the brain is called functional magnetic resonance imaging, which you're gonna learn a little bit more about tonight. Um, but really sort of the occasion that sort of, or what really occasioned this uh, uh, this uh, talk series is that LIBER, or Lloyd Institute for Brain Research, was selected to be part of this really once in a generation study called the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study, the ABCD study. So LIBER was um, selected as one of a handful of sites uh, throughout America to uh, uh, collect data on 12,000 uh, nine and 10 year old kids and to follow them for 10 years and to study how their brains change throughout adolescence and how the things that happen to them and the things that they do to their brains uh, affect uh, the, uh, uh, ultimately the, the kind of adults that they turn into. And, and um, one day what we hope to do is with all this massive amount of data, and believe me, it's a massive amount of data, to be able to go back and sort of back sort that data and figure out what were the biological markers, the, the, the predictors of which kids would, would go on to maybe try marijuana, or which kids would go on to binge drink, or which kids would go on to become depressed or, or anxious, or which kids would go on to be really resilient. Right? And, so, um, and so it's really uh, a study unlike anything that's ever been done before, and it's uh, really a testament to LIBOR that we actually got selected to be one of the sites. Okay, so, um, before we sort of get into the talk, I've got to introduce an idea to you. Um, and this, this idea is called dualism, or Cartesian dualism. Um, Rene Descartes was a French philosopher, and he's really sort of the, he wasn't the guy who really exactly came up with the idea, he'd been around for a while, but he's the guy who's really sort of pegged as the, as the, the main force behind this idea. And, and dualism says uh, that mental phenomena are not completely physical. In other words, the mind and the brain are, at least at some level, separate. And um, we're going to talk about some of the implications of that idea. This was an extremely, and, and I would argue still, extremely influential idea. So the idea was that um, the mind, which, which Descartes sort of um, uh, equated to some extent with the soul, um, was separate from the brain. And, and he had to come up with a way of like, well, how do they actually interact? And, and Descartes did uh, lots of neuroanatomical studies, and he looked through the brain, and he figured, you know, we only have one soul or one mind, so it's probably the case that the seat of that, uh, or the, the connection point between the mind and the, the physical brain must be in, in something called the pineal gland. 
And the reason why is because we only have one of them, unlike most of the other structures in the brain where you have one on each side. And I'm looking at Elmus here because Elmus is a uh, neuroanatomist. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, and this was an incredibly influential idea, right? That the mind and the brain are separate. And I'm gonna argue tonight that this actually turns out to be a very bad idea. And you'll see why. So we're gonna start by talking about uh, a very brief introduction to brain science. Um, we're gonna talk about how changes, in particular injury uh, to the brain, affects the mind. And then we're gonna talk about how changes in other body systems outside the brain affect the mind and the brain, right? So that's gonna be things like sleep, nutrition, and exercise. All right, so get everybody oriented here, okay? I've been told, I have to, I have to provide a warning, I've been told that I have to keep my inner nerd in check, okay? <laughs> so if there's at any point in this talk, and I'm serious, any point in this talk, I start saying words that um, are hard to understand or you don't know where I'm going with this, I want you to raise your hand and interrupt me and say, hey, tell us what that means, okay? <laughs> this is a brain. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and just to be clear, it's the outer surface of the brain. Here's the middle of the brain. So if you were to cut right down the middle and sort of look at it, uh, you see the middle of the brain. This leads down to the spinal cord. Um, and there's a couple of features about the brain that I want you to just know about, just to get you oriented <coughs> to some of the things we're gonna talk about. So um, the first thing is what we call the cortex. So the features of the cortex are, if you sort of blow up this section here, you'll notice that, uh, that there's these ridges and these valleys, right? So you have a gyrus and a sulcus, right? So gyri and sulci. Um, if we now zoom in, do you see this section right here? If we zoom in on this and we look at uh, this gray area, so you notice there's some gray stuff and some white stuff. If you look in the gray area and you magnify it, this is basically what you see. You see what's called a cortical column. And, um, and you'll see that in that cortical column there are neurons that are arranged in certain orders. Okay? You can see those here. So this is a, this gray, what we call gray matter, is a thin layer of cells approximately uh, 1.5 to 4 millimeters thick. And if you'll notice, these cells project down here and then there's lines down here, right? So that actually is the beginning of what's called white matter. That's the white stuff. And the white matter are the connections between cells and between brain regions, okay? So what are these cells? Well, these cells are neurons. So if you look here, let's take, uh, let's take this guy right here, okay? So you'll notice that we have, uh, in this case, we've got structures down here, and then we've got this thing, and then we've got this long line. Well, that maps onto this. So this is a neuron. So you have dendrites, which uh, receive information from other neurons. That information is passed to the, the soma or the cell body where it is, uh, the information is processed in the nucleus and through complex uh, uh, gene transcription and, and that sort of thing, information, um, information processing takes place in the cell body. And then, and then there's an electrochemical event that sends, that, uh, sends a signal down this long um, arm, which we call an axon. And that axon is wrapped in a fatty substance called myelin, and that, that my, myelin sheath is, uh, is white. That's where you get the white matter from. Um, so that projects then to, uh, to these uh, axon terminals, and the axon terminals then release neurotransmitters, which pass across a gap and, to, and, and activate the dendrites on the next neuron. And basically what you have is this complex interaction of a bunch of neurons working together. Now there's approximately 25 billion neurons in the cortex of the brain. All right, so that's that outer, uh, outer uh, gray matter. Um, that works out to about, uh, or a little bit over 62,000 miles of axons in every brain. So in every person's brain in this, re in this room, You've got, if you lined up all the axons, you could wrap around the earth about three times. Right? So we're talking about a staggering uh, amount of, of, um, of uh, ability to project information around the brain. So if you notice, right, so every one of these neurons have lots of axon terminals, and those connect up with lots of other neurons, right? The other 
you know, 25 billion or so neurons. And that means that you have approximately 300 trillion synapses. So that's a lot of connections. And we're pretty certain that the, you know, the, the powerful minds, the, the brains, all the things that we do as humans come from that, uh, that incredibly complex interaction of neurons and those 300 trillion synapses. Okay, so how do we study the brain? Well, there's a, uh, there's a lot of ways we study the brain. So one way we do it is by observing the effects of stimulation and medications on animal behavior. So what you see here uh, is, a, uh, is a rat in what's called an optogenetic study. I'm not gonna go into the details of optogenetics except to say that using certain types of light, you can turn on uh, certain types of neurons in, in a rat's brain and, and measure how changes in the activity of certain types of neurons produce different types of behavior. And so does everybody remember, anybody remember this when they were a kid? It's just as a sort of a side note, right? So, you know, there's these rats and they're doing stuff to them and sometimes it makes them kind of smart. Uh, and there was a book when we were all kids called The Secret of Nim, right? There was a, stu it was a book about, um, about really smart rats. And uh, before I, I came here to LIBOR, I was uh, a research fellow, a postdoc, and then a research fellow at the National Institute of Mental Health, uh, which is right outside of DC, which is pretty much the largest biomedical research facility in the world. And I was there about a year before I realized that the NIM and the secret of NIM was the National Institute of Mental Health. So I'm not a real quick guy, right? <laughs> Just know that. I'm kind of slow on the uptake sometimes. All right, how else do we study the brain? Well, we study the brain uh, using, uh, for example, magnetic resonance imaging. So uh, this is a typical MRI scanner uh, that we would use for research purposes. This is actually the one that's downstairs here at LIBOR. And, uh, and there's two different types of scans that we do. So the first is, um, is a structural scan. So a lot of you may, uh, hopefully not too many of you, have had the experience of being in an MRI. And they might take a, uh, uh, an image of your knee or of your back. And, and usually what they're doing for that is they're making a structural scan. And, Certain types of pulse sequences from this magnet uh, allow you to map the uh, high resolution structure of the brain. Right? So that's what you see here. Now that's telling you about the structure of the brain. And that's good, that's interesting, but there's actually something cool that we can do beyond that. And that is functional magnetic resonance imaging. So imagine, let's just go back here so you can see this. Imagine we put people in there and we show them a checkerboard that flashes back and forth like that. And we use a different type of pulse sequence that allows us to look at the ratio of oxygenated to deoxygenated blood in the brain, which is a measure, it's an analog for, for brain activity. When we do that, we get um, a much lower resolution image. That has to do with the physics of these sorts of functional scans. But there's something very cool that we can do with that image, and that is we can look at the changes in the blood oxygenation over time. Right? So you can see here, remember I was showing you the flashing checkerboard, where you can see if we look back in visual cortex that the activity of that region goes up and down, up and down. Does everybody see that? That's the basis of functional magnetic resonance imaging. We have people out in the scanner do some task that we know the timing of that event, and then we're able to look at the, the uh, relationship between their brain activity and, uh, and that event. So we can take this time series and we can do a lot of statistics uh, and we can begin to produce uh, maps or we, we can begin to map function onto structure. So we take that functional map and we overlay it onto that structural map and we do statistical analyses and that's how you get sometimes what we sort of refer to as the pretty pictures, right? And so these are actually uh, uh, some just figures from, uh, from studies from my lab that have been published in recent years where we can look and we can see, for example, in the ventral pallidum when people are looking at food pictures that you can see increases in activity over time that reflect changes in, in activity in that region of the brain. Okay, so that's one way, or that's a second way that we study the brain. There's another, I think, very interesting way that you can study the brain, and that is to observe the effects of injury on the brain. 
And that brings us to one of my favorite things in neuroscience, which is the story of Phineas Gage. Does anybody know about Phineas Gage, right? So Phineas Gage um, was a very well-respected uh, man in, uh, he was in the 19th century, this was in, I guess it was upstate New York, and he was a foreman for a team that was um, clearing paths for railroads. And one day, they were uh, using a tamping iron to push dynamite down into a hole, right? Because they were gonna blast some rock. And something went wrong, and there was an explosion, and that tamping iron, which is this rod right here, blasted up, went through his head, went all the way out of his head, and landed some yards away. The amazing thing was that Phineas Gage lived, but he was never the same. And so this is actually a, a uh, that we, we, to this day, we have actually in a library at Harvard, they actually have Phineas Gage's uh, skull. And uh, this is a drawing of that skull and the path that the rod took as it blasted through his head. Why is this interesting? Well, because this is one of the classic, what we call neuropsychology cases. Phineas Gage was this well-respected man. He was known for being sort of very sort of sober and uh, uh, a very well-liked person, very sort of a lot of emotional regulation. After this accident, he was almost, he was a wild man, right? He got into trouble, he cursed all the time, he was really impulsive, it was impossible to deal with. And what we learned from that is that something about the tissue that that tamping iron blasted through controls or contributes in some way to behavioral inhibition, right? And controlling uh, what they described at the time as our animal desires, right? There's a whole field called neuropsychology that does these sorts of studies, and I think it's really fascinating. Um, so what have we learned from studies of brain injury? What we've learned is you better protect your brain because there are certain not good things that you can do to your brain that have, um, have um, really negative long-term consequences. Let me give you an example of that. So this is a study that was published uh, just a couple years ago or a few years ago now, about the effects of mild traumatic brain injury on cognitive performance, right? So this is, in this case, these are adults who suffered uh, what we would describe as a, you know, a mild concussion, right? The sort of thing that would happen very commonly in a football game or, a, or a, a, a hockey match or something like that. And we've got two different measures here. They actually did a lot of different uh, tests in this. But the point I want you to get from this is that in both measures of working memory and mental processing speed, so how much information you can hold in mind and how fast you can use information that, that you have in mind. Um, if you had mild traumatic brain injury and what's called post-concussive syndrome, which is basically sort of feeling foggy afterwards for some period of time, you were much, uh, you had much poorer working memory and you were much mentally slower. So that seems bad, right? Everybody agree that's bad? <laughs> Believe me, it's worse than you think because this is long-term effects. The effects that you're seeing here are one year after injury. Right? That's why we have to take seriously um, the findings that we're seeing now about uh, the long-term effects of things like playing football. I played football when I was in high school. I loved football. It's a bit of a problem for me now because I study the brain. Okay. <laughs> um, and this is not a popular view in Oklahoma, believe me. But um, I think if we ask ourselves, what can we do about this? The answer is there's certain activities that we probably need to minimize. And other things we can do to protect our brains. Like if you have kids, when they ride their bicycle or they ride their scooter, they need to wear a helmet. My kids, I just they roll their eyes whenever they like, go to the garage and get, in their, get their bike because they know I'm going to say, put your helmet on. Okay, so that's an example. I, I would argue that the you know, failure to recognize the effects of certain behaviors on, on, on the mind is an example of dualism, right? The idea that the mind might be separate from the brain, right? Here we have example of how you can, you can harm the brain and, and it has the effect of, um, of changing the mind. But I would argue that there's actually a more deep-seated and in some ways insidious form of dualism. So that's the dualism we talked about earlier, 
But in fact, there's another type of dualism. That's the idea that the body is separate from the mind, right? And when I mean the body, I'm basically, in this case, talking about stuff that happens from the chin down. So we talked about how insults to our brains affect our minds. How do changes in other body systems affect the mind? And there's going to be three examples we're going to look at. We're going to look at sleep, we're going to look at eating or nutrition, and we're going to look at exercise. This is one of my favorite quotes. Sleep is the golden chain that ties health and our bodies together. And I would say it's our bodies and our brains. So we spend approximately a third of our lives asleep, or at least we should, <laughs> um, but we don't always. Well, what's the consequence of that in terms of our behavior? Well, let me give you an example. So this is a classic study that was published in Nature, which is one of the, the major scientific journals way back, this is in 1997. And, and what they did was they had subjects um, do simple hand-eye coordination tasks in this case, but this has been replicated with lots of other cognitive tasks. Um, and what they did was they measured their performance as they went longer and longer periods of time without sleeping. And what you see here is a graph where they, they mapped performance uh, after hours of wake, certain hours of wakefulness against performance by blood alcohol right, concentration. Right? And basically what they found was that um, if you wake up at 7 a.m., by midnight, your performance on this task and lots of other cognitive tasks is in the same range as a person who is legally impaired. Right? That's how important sleep is, just from one day. Right? Now, you think about, for example, um, uh, medical students. Right? And we've all heard stories about what they struggle with right, in terms of their shifts. Just think about if you're the patient, what you want. Right? You, want a, you want a med student who, uh, or a doctor who has uh, just taken a nap. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about, about what sleep is. Right? So I think this is important. So we refer to this as sleep architecture. And, um, and understanding sleep architecture is important if you're gonna understand what you need to do to, uh, to minimize the effects of lack of sleep on, on the brain and on the mind. So when we go to sleep at night, um, so if you think about this as sort of stages of sleep, we start out awake, and then as we go on, we go into deeper sleep. And then at about 90 minutes, we hit what's called REM sleep, right? Everybody's heard about REM sleep. REM sleep is, is very good for our brains. And I want you to notice what happens. So about 90 minutes in, we hit REM sleep. sleep. And we, we're in REM sleep for you know, maybe like 15, 20, 30 minutes. And we come out of REM sleep and we go into deeper sleep. And this kind of goes up. And then we hit REM sleep again. This time REM sleep's a little longer than it was earlier. And then we come out, we don't go quite as deep. And then we hit REM sleep again. And now we're in REM sleep even longer. Now, but we don't go quite as deep. And now we're in REM sleep longer. And by the time you get to seven, eight hours of sleep, you're spending a, a much larger percentage of the time that you're asleep in REM sleep, which we know is a particularly restorative type of sleep. Now, if you look at this, what this would suggest to you, if you think this is particularly restorative sleep, it means you probably need to what? Stay asleep continuously for a long time. So why do we sleep? Well, it turns out, um, considering this is something we do for like a third of our lives, uh, there's a lot of debate about why we sleep. So one idea is that it has to do with rest or restoration. And there's a whole set of genes called clock genes that help control uh, our sleep and all sorts of bodily functions related to sleep. Another idea, which actually there's a good deal of evidence for, is memory consolidation. So it turns out that things we learn during the day, when we go to sleep and we have those REM episodes, our brain sort of locks in the information that we learn during the day and it helps us remember it. So that's what we refer to as memory consolidation. So maybe that's a function of sleep. My favorite or my sort of my pet idea at the moment is uh, the uh, brain cleaning hypothesis. And this is really amazing because it turns out, now I just want to remind you, right, it's 2017, right? We just turned 2017. This finding that came out actually at the end of 2013 was hugely influential because it turns out there's an entire organ system in the human body we didn't even know we had, right? We didn't even know we had this until just a few years ago. 
It's called the glymphatic system. And basically what happens is it turns out that when we go to sleep, and particularly during REM sleep, there are changes in the tissues in our brain that cause uh, a process by which our brain like actually physically cleans itself. It takes um, lots of, of waste material that's left over from thinking and working and you know the brain, the neurons firing during the day, and it cleans it out. And the degree to which it does that affects and is related to all sorts of cognitive functions. Um, so the answer to why we sleep is we don't know exactly, but we know that it, it involves all of these things. Okay, so this is a, um, this is uh, a talk that's related to ABCD. So I'm gonna throw in some things about adolescence here. Let me just get a show of hands here. So how many parents in the room might possibly have noticed that their kids are a bit sort of emotionally reactive the day after they go to a slumber party, <laughs> right? Anybody? I see a lot of hands. I can tell you my kids, like my kids, like Tabitha, when she goes to a slumber party, she comes up the next day, if you look at her wrong, she goes into reactor breach. Yeah. It's, not, it's not pretty, okay? Well, it turns out we have evidence about why that is. So uh, the study that was, uh, that was uh, done at Emory University, where, which is where I went to graduate school, um, actually some of my professors uh, published this just uh, last <coughs> year, and, uh, and what they did was they took kids, uh, adolescents, and, uh, and they looked at um, uh, how their brains responded to angry or, or neutral faces, and they found that the kids when they were sleep deprived showed, or the kids that were sleep deprived, showed um, much greater activation regions such as the amygdala, which is involved in emotional reactivity. So clearly, the loss of sleep in these kids was causing them to respond in a sort of more emotionally reactive way. Okay, so uh, show of hands, how many parents in the room might possibly have noticed their kids make all sorts of bad decisions the day after a slumber party? <laughs> yeah, okay, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, turns out there's evidence for why that's the case too. So. Uh, so this is a study where they, they looked at, uh, in adolescence, um, risk-taking behavior in a, in a game when the, the kids were in a brain scanner. And what they showed was that um, the poor, the sleep quality that the kids had, the lower the activity in a region called the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that's involved in inhibiting and controlling and sort of sculpting our behavior and making us less impulsive. There you go. There's the sort of neural signature of why kids after that slumber party the next day sometimes make not the best decisions. Um, so how much sleep should we get? Well, it varies by, uh, by our stage in life. So you'll notice that newborns and infants and toddlers, they need you know, anywhere from you know, 12, 13, 14, up to 17 hours of sleep a day. Um, by the time you get to teenagers, uh, they really need eight to 10 hours, right? If they're getting less than that, it's ultimately not, uh, not good for them. Um, young adults and adults, it needs to be seven to nine hours. That's the recommended amount, right? You really wanna shoot for about eight hours, hopefully eight hours of uninterrupted sleep. So given this, and given what I showed you about sleep architecture, what should you do? Well, the first thing is Get rid of all the technology in the bedroom, right? Uh, for all sorts of reasons I won't go into, actually it turns out the light even, the color of the light on a lot of our, of our uh, iPhones, and believe me, I am super guilty of this, right? Um, uh, actually causes changes in our brain that actually wakes us up, right? And so, um, so before bedtime we need to cut out the, uh, the tech. Um, there's been a whole sort of series of studies that have talked about the importance of like bedtime yoga and doing things physically to sort of relax your body as you get ready for bed. Um, setting in a, a set sleep schedule helps. Um, no tech in the bedroom, relax before bedtime, and it turns out actually setting the temperature a little bit cooler actually helps um, with, uh, with sleep quality and, uh, and has effects. Okay. So what's another area that turns out is important for um, uh, the relationship between the body and the brain? And nutrition's one of them, right? So you, you are what you eat, sort of. All right, 
So we eat approximately 60 million calories in a lifetime. Unless we go to, say, like Cheesecake Factory, in which case we eat approximately 60 million calories in an evening. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> um, but it turns out it matters, of those 60 million calories we eat in a lifetime, it turns out it matters a lot where those calories come from. <coughs> so here's what I want to do. I want to go with this metaphor. Think of your body as a car. All right? So you have this car. And a lot of cars today are flex fuel cars, meaning you can put uh, somewhat different types of fuel into the car and it'll run. So, it turns out it's amazing how many kinds of fuels our bodies can run on. In fact, strangely enough, our bodies can actually run on themselves, right? If you go without eating, you have stored energy on your body most notably in the form of adipose tissue or fat, that your body can begin to churn through to find energy. Importantly though, this doesn't mean it runs equally well on all fuels. And that's a big problem. And it's a big problem because this is the world in which our brains evolved, right? We evolved, the brains that we have evolved in a world where food was scarce and it tended to be uh, uh, lower in calories, right? Uh, less energy dense. Um, and, and that's significant. And, and as a result, right, because of this, we developed neural systems that, um, that make us respond to certain types of food more than others, right? And what is that? That's food that's energy dense, right? Things that are high in fat and high in carbohydrate, and high in sugar. We feel good and we want those things. But that turns out to be a problem because this is the world our brains evolved in and this is the world our brains live in today. Right? We are walking around in a 21st century world with Pleistocene brains and there's this misfit between the two. And I would argue that that distinction, that misfit underlies a whole lot of problems in our society. So we have these neural systems that, uh, that uh, evolved to respond to food pictures, or I'm sorry, to foods. So we see foods out there in the world, and uh, that information is passed, for example, to the, the front of the brain, particularly the orbital cortex, which goes, uh, has projections to reward regions such as the nucleus accumbens and the ventral pallidum, and then that gets passed out to the anterior cingulate and the subgenual anterior cingulate, and all of these regions then begin to produce behaviors that procure that food, right? This is wired into our brains. So if you're gonna have a system that's wired into our brains to make us wanna eat uh, lots and lots of, of high calorie foods, and if you're gonna live in a world where that food is actually now easily available, you'd better have a good break on this system. Otherwise, you're gonna run into trouble fast. And it turns out we do have uh, pretty good breaks, several breaks in fact. One of those breaks uh, that we'll talk about tonight is, is leptin. Okay, so leptin is a hormone that's made by adipose tissue or the fat tissue on our body that regulates appetite among many other things. We're gonna get to that many other things in a second here. So you have fat tissue on your body and it's releasing as that fat tissue, you get more of it uh, begins to release more leptin, and leptin travels through your bloodstream to uh, a region of your brain called the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus sends signals out to the rest of the brain which says, okay, we've got enough energy stored on board, let's dial it down now. And so it suppresses your appetite, and so you should, in principle, stop eating, right? You should eat less. So you, you, you hear that and you think, okay, that sounds good why don't we just give ourselves lots of leptin and we'll eat less, right? Magic bullet, magic bullet. Well, it turns out leptin does some other things and that's where, um, that's where we run into problems because leptin does more than just put the brakes on appetite. Leptin also plays a role in inflammation. And this is why obesity is associated with chronic inflammation. So in very, very broad terms, basically what happens is you have leptin and leptin um, produces um, inflama inflammatory markers. It produces uh, cytokines. And those cytokines, unfortunately, have all sorts of effects in the body, uh, one of which 
is that it promotes the, uh, the mRNA expression of leptin, which produces more leptin, which produces more cytokines, which produces more leptin, which produces more cytokines. And pretty soon, you get chronic inflammation. And from the chronic inflammation, you have a whole host of bad things that can happen in your body, including insulin, re insulin re resistance, which leads to diabetes, heart disease, cancer, arthritis, and even depression, right? Remember what we were talking about. Things that happen in the body can af affect the mind, in this case, the mind and mood. So we've just seen how inflammation can arise from the body's response to how much you eat, but can inflammation arise from the body's response to what you eat? Turns out that uh, when we eat high fat diets, it changes what we call our gut microbiome. So in our guts, there are just stunning numbers of cells, right, uh, of, of gut microbes, right? These are, these are microbes, they're non-human cells that live in our bodies. And in fact, if you count them, there's more of them than there are human cells in our bodies, right? Which should make, you, make your head kind of spin for a minute. Uh, and it turns out that when you, um, when you eat a high fat, high fat diet, it causes changes in that gut floor, or the, the type of microbes that you have in your gut, which increase the permeability of your gut, which lead to increased uh, lipopolysaccharide absorption, which leads to endotoxemia, which leads to inflammation, which leads to metabolic disorders, which leads to chronic inflammation, and all those things that we talked about earlier. So simply eating a high fat diet changes the interaction between the microbes in your body and your body, and that ultimately leads to effects on, on your brain and your mood. Um, and, and I think one of the most interesting examples of this with respect to development, right, going back to this theme about ABCD, is this study that I think is really kind of classic about um, uh, demonstrating that children and adolescents may be particularly vulnerable to dietary effects on brain health. So this, uh, this study was published in Hippocampus um, a little over a year ago, which is a, a, a scientific journal, looked at the effects of sucrose and high fructose corn syrup consumption on memory and hippocampal function. And this gets a little complicated, but the, the take home message I want you to get from this, so you've got two different, uh, two different types of tasks, right? So you've got a maze task, and you've got a, uh, a memory task that these rats are doing, and you've got adolescents and adults. Adolescents and adults. So the adolescent rats are up here, the adults or adult rats are down here. And the take home message from this slide is that you'll notice that in the adults, there's no difference between the groups, including those that are, have a high, uh, high fructose corn syrup diet, in terms of their, uh, their uh, maze training and their, their learning and their memory function. But in the adolescents, there is. And in particular, the high fructose corn syrup diet in these rats leads to worse performance, okay? So you see this interaction between the, the content of the rats' diets and, and what's happening to them. <coughs> okay, so uh, we know, so that's all memory stuff, right? So we know that there's a particular structure in the brain that's really important for memory, and that's called the hippocampus, right? So the hippocampus in rats is located here, and in humans, it's here. And both rats, adolescent rats, and, and human kids both have hippocampi. And so things that we learn about rat hippocampi probably hold for kid hippocampi too. But we don't want to cut up kids' brains. We want to cut up rats' brains. So we're going to do that in this case. And when we do that to these rats that were in the study, what you find is that in the hippocampus of the, of the adolescent rats, but not the adult rats, there are higher levels of inflammation in the high fructose corn syrup diet, right? So what that means is that uh, in the rats, when they were adolescents and they were put on a high fructose corn syrup diet, they had higher inflammation in their hippocampus and that is most likely the cause of the poor memory and, uh, and learning in these, in these rats, okay? I just wanna point out in this study, they only looked in the hippocampus. It's probably the case that this inflammation was all over the brain as well. 
So, what do we take from this? Although some cars can run on a variety of fuels, right? If you put bad gasoline or bad oil or bad transmission fluid into a really nice car, you're gonna end up with this, <laughs> all right? I've owned some cars that look like this. <laughs> Although our bodies, similarly, can run on lots of different types of fuels, if you put bad fuels in our body, you're going to get a brain that looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, this is my MRI. Um, all right, so what can you do? All right. Well, um, you can eat healthy. Right? So what does that mean? Well, I always, when I, when I give a talk like this, I have this slide and I give a talk like at schools, I always just tell them, look, there's these certain dietary heuristics. I don't call them heuristics when I'm talking to kids in schools. Um, this is a guy named Michael Pollan who writes about, about eating. And he says, if it came from a plant, eat it. If it was made in a plant, don't. Right? Or another one, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Or if you're talking to kids, this is really important, don't eat breakfast cereals that change the color of the milk, okay? All right, what else can you do to help your brain? Well, recently scientists have identified a new prescription that will improve sleep, reduce leptin insensitivity, reduce inflammation, markedly improve cerebrovascular function and brain health, improve cognitive function, and like many other prescriptions, it comes in many forms. Right? So lots of drugs out there, you can take it in lots of different forms. And this recent discovery by scientists is exercise. Right? It comes in lots of forms, but it turns out it's all good for the brain. All right. So tonight, I haven't gone into a lot of the details, but I've talked about a lot of complex biochemical pathways. So we've got the stress or the HPA axis system. We talked about clock genes and sleep. We talked about leptin and metabolic signaling. We talked about inflammatory responses. There's all these incredibly complex biochemical systems that underlie all of these things. And there's a big problem, and that is that minor modifications, and, and, and importantly, all these systems are like linked together intricately. So minor modifications in any one part of these pathways can have unexpected and not necessarily good effects on other parts of the pathway. So remember the story about leptin, right? Leptin has effects on appetite, right? You might think, well, let's just give ourselves a bunch of leptin, but it turns out leptin has effects on <coughs> inflammation. Well, it turns out that's not such a good idea, right? So it's really hard to figure out how to manipulate one little thing in the system without causing all sorts of crazy things to happen in other parts of the system. Interestingly, exercise influences all of these systems in a unified or integrated way. And it's probably because it ev we evolved uh, all these systems together to support physical action. Right? And so as a result, exercise really is kind of the magic bullet where you can do this one thing and move all of these systems around in a healthy way together. And it's, uh, it turns out it's a really, really complex, the, the effects of exercise on the body are really complex, um, but there's, uh, there's a whole sort of pathway by which um, certain types of, uh, well not certain types, physical activity of the muscles produces certain changes in, uh, in biochemical signaling pathways that lead to changes uh, you know, throughout the body and ultimately in the brain, creating uh, a substance called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. And BDNF uh, changes uh, other sort of receptors in the brain that lead to um, neuro greater neuroplasticity, so the ability to learn new things as well as neurogenesis, the ability to grow new neurons, and that's all because of changes out in the body in terms of physical activity. So if you want to grow your brain, you move your body a lot, right? And just a little side note here, it turns out there's a whole lot of studies that show that when you're talking about effects on the brain, aerobic exercise is particularly important, particularly 30 minutes or more. So if you can get 30 minutes or more of continuous aerobic exercise, you really turn these systems on and, and have big effects on, uh, on uh, neuro, uh, neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. And because of that, um, uh, the, uh, we find all sorts of effects in terms of uh, exercise on cognition. So for example, this was from, this is now a, a fairly old uh, meta-analysis, but they showed across 
um, lots of different types of cognitive functions, like executive functions, which is like related to decision making, or uh, spatial, uh, 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 spatial memory, or speed of processing, how fast you're able to think. Uh, those who were put on exercise regimes did better. And similarly, in pre-adolescent children, um, there's studies that show that um, <coughs> kids who have uh, higher fitness levels show better activity and more efficient activity in regions of the brain, kind of like the, the sort of what I was telling you earlier about the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, regions of the brain that are important for regulating behavior. Okay, so we come back to Descartes and, um, and we ask, you know, why are these findings matter? Why does all the things that I've shown you tonight matter? Well, they suggest that this idea of dualism probably doesn't hold. Things that happen uh, in the brain affect the mind, and things that happen in the body affect the mind, okay? And we might be inclined to think that, okay, you know, it's 2017, we've all heard about these sorts of findings that I just described really quickly here over the last 30 minutes or so. Maybe we're not dualists anymore. I would argue that's not true. And the reason why is because all you have to do is look at the policies and the decisions we make about how we, uh, we raise kids in our society that suggest that that's not the case. So for example, just a couple of years ago, uh, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine took to, ca took to task the American educational system um, for their decision to cut back on physical activity in schools. Based on what I showed you earlier, it sure seems like a pretty good idea if we had kids in school doing a lot of physical activity. Their minds would work better. They would learn better if we did that. But we've cut back on it. I would argue that to some extent, the reason why we've done that is because we have this sort of latent or insidious dualism, right? Where we don't think about the relationship between what happens to our bodies and what happens to our brains. Here's another example, policy example of it school lunches. So approximately 31 million children participate in the USDA National School Lunch <coughs> Program each school day. Of that, approximately 21 million kids qualified for free or reduced price lunches, which means that they likely get a significant <coughs> proportion of their nutrition from schools. Here's the reason why that's a problem. So I want you to pay attention to this blue bar right here. What that shows you is the percentage of schools meeting the recommended dietary standards, and the blue bar shows you the average lunch served to children in schools across America. And what you'll see is that only 34% of, uh, of the school lunches meet the recommended standards for the amount of fat. <coughs> only 50% have the recommended amount of saturated fat. Only 1% have the recommended sodium and 1% of the recommended dietary fiber, right? The take home message here is elections have consequences because the reason this happens is because schools don't have enough money, right? And our, our country makes certain decisions about its farm bill, right? And what sorts of foods we're gonna fund as a, our government's gonna fund. And, and so certain types of foods are cheaper and we feed those, ki those foods to our kids and they have effects on their body. They have consequences for their body and their brain. And in this case, I would argue, you get about 21 million consequences a day. All right? This, to me, seems like another example at the societal level of the consequences of dualism. Okay, so what's the take home for the whole talk? It's that you only get one brain. So you gotta take care of it, and you gotta take care of your body. And if you do, they're gonna take you far. All right, questions? We'll start at the front and work. Sure. Okay, repeat the question, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I just have one question about uh, REM sleep, the, the diagram that you showed up there. Um, I, I always heard that REM sleep was kind of when you dream. Is that still the... Yeah, it's not exclusively when you dream, but, uh, but yeah, that's when a lot of your dreams happen. And, and to be clear, when you are in REM sleep, your brain is really active. There's almost no time that your brain is as active as when you're in REM sleep, which is a little bit 
unexpected. Just yeah. to follow on that, um, there are some devices you can use that will help you to wake up and time your sleep cycles. Uh, mm -hmm. Are there any like published studies on the effects of those? Any damage? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. I'm. I wouldn't be surprised if there are, but I'm not familiar with that area. So, okay, you get it. You get the question. Um, why is exercising one of the one of the things that you have to do to make your brain to make your brain smart? Yeah, it's a great question. So the question was, why is exercising one of the things you have to do to make your brain smarter? So when I start exercising, particularly if I go running for like more than 30 minutes at a time, um, my body begins to um, undergo changes, my muscles and my legs and my arms, right? They, they undergo changes and, and how they use energy, right? How they use the fuel that I put in my body um, changes and it leads to all sorts of changes in, my, in our bodies that, um, that ultimately cause our brains to grow new neurons, those cells I was telling you about at the beginning, right, that we use to think. Does that make sense? Sort of. It sort of makes sense to me, too, so it's okay. Yeah, you get a question. Why is REM sleep so good for your brain? Um, it's, that's a good question. So remember I was telling you about that, that brain cleaning hypothesis? Well, when you go into, brain, when you go into REM sleep, there's changes literally in the, the question was why is REM sleep so good for your brain? Uh, there's changes in the tissues in your brain, right? That cause your brain to clean itself, right? And just like if you don't clean your room, you kind of like walk through and you trip over and stuff's in the way and just, it's, it's harder to move around, your brain's the same way. Does that make sense? Okay, you had a question. Counterpart that you compared data with because, like, I taught in France for a while, yeah. and just like with the whole of children and everything, I remember this article floating around a couple of years ago and it said French kids don't get ADD. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, French kids aren't angels, but they, have, they, they don't have the, um, you know, the acting out in school and such that we seem to have here. Is that just purely diet, or I mean, do you guys get into overseas? There are people who study. So the question is. You know, why are French kids better than American kids? <laughs> and, um, and so, <laughs> not exactly. Um, but no, no, the, the um, yeah, so there's, there are people who actually study cross-cultural effects. I'm not familiar of, with the cross-cultural differences in, um, like say, for example, attention, right? Um, but we certainly know that, you know, the environment that we're in affects and, and in essence sculpts our brains. And so, you know, if you grow up in an environment, let's, let's, let's take a different sort of environment, right? So if you grow up in an environment where there's high, high levels of poverty, right? You don't get enough food. Maybe, you, um, maybe you, you don't have access to lots of books, right? Maybe there's a lot of threat, right? So, you know, you live in kind of a tough neighborhood, right? That's gonna have different physical and, and ultimately mental consequences, right, um, compared to if you grow up in an environment that, you know, has plenty, right, where your food is, you know, readily available and you have healthier food and um, there's less stress, right, and, um, and, um, and less threat of violence, right, so that's going to have effects on the stress, the stress hormones. So that's a really extreme example of kind of differences in culture that might lead to differences in, in, in brains. And there actually is, is data to support that. Um, but I'm not familiar about I mean, I just, French I just culture versus American. Their, their lunches were four-star meals. I mean, yeah, things yeah. that kids would not, you know, they had salad and they had a vegetable and they had a yeah. cheese course after. I mean, like everything, like the whole nine yards. Yeah. So it's just a really different to see, like I said, most kids here would even do it. Not eat it. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> it was nice for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? What would you say the effects of cortisol are on the on the brain from lack of sleep or stress or poor diet? Yeah. So in the short term, um, this is kind of a favorite topic of mine a little bit. So, uh, <laughs> but um, in the short term, so first off, the, the the idea was what's the effects of cortisol, right? So first, I got to back up. Does everybody know what cortisol is? Probably not. 
So cortisol is a, uh, is a hormone that's released, is a, a protein that's released uh, uh, in the body in response to stress, and it has all sorts of effects on all sorts of uh, body systems, right? So it, it affects how our cells use energy, how, how they use glucose, for example. It affects our, our immune system, right? Um, and it affects information processing in the brain, right? In some direct and indirect ways. So, um, so you remember that, that, that bit about how we have Pleistocene brains in a 21st century world, right? The type of stressors that we have today are very different than the types of stressors that we had back then, right? Um, you know, in, uh, in the Pleistocene, people didn't worry about paying their taxes, right? They didn't have taxes. They worried about predation, right? They worried about predators uh, or, or, you know, uh, availability of food and that sort of thing. Um, and, and as a result, right, we evolve systems to respond uh, really well to short, quick threats. And today, we live in a world where we, day in, day out, are under lower level but much longer term threats. And our bodies just aren't made to tolerate it. And so, uh, and so when you have that sort of chronic uh, anxiety, chronic stress, it, uh, it turns out it's neurotoxic. It actually uh, causes certain structures in the brain to get smaller and shrink. Uh, it uh, is pro-inflammatory, so it makes, uh, it makes you be more inclined to have inflammation. It promotes uh, fat deposition, right? So you tend to store fat all over your body uh, more readily when you have higher cortisol levels. And, uh, and all those things are not good. So the answer is, prime, no, well I shouldn't say primarily, one of the reasons why stress is so bad for us is because our, our bodies aren't built to respond to chronic stress. Right? So it's again, it's that misfit between the bodies and brains that we have and the world we live in today. Did you say that Facebook in 2016 increased cortisol? <laughs> Do you increase cortisol? I think it probably increased okay. cortisol. <laughs> I think a lot of people have really high cortisol levels right now. <laughs> so, next question, yeah. Um, I'm curious, and with that last topic in mind, um, the types of exercise that we choose and the um, effect it has on our nervous system mm -hmm. and the role of mindfulness, mm -hmm. perhaps, in the equation. Yeah. So specifically, like, are there certain types of exercise that are better, and will they have certain types of cognitive effects? Yeah, this is actually this is actually um, a really interesting question that's kind of a kind of a hot topic right now about well, you know, what types of exercise are best for your brain, and what types of exercise are best, you know, for different things, uh, and even like are certain types of cognitive functions. Uh, more related to certain types of, or improved more by certain types of exercise. It's a really complicated story. I can tell you that setting aside a lot of the debates around that, aerobic exercise is really good, right? So you, you definitely want to have uh, a big component of aerobic exercise. It, it's just good for brain health, right? It's good for a lot of different body systems. Mindfulness. Uh, is also a really hot area, right? So there's a lot of studies about, actually folks here at LIBOR actually study mindfulness. And, um, and, um, and does everybody know what mindfulness is? So mindfulness uh, sort of comes out of medi the, sort of the meditation movement and, and basically it involves a way of thinking about your own thoughts, right? In a non-judgmental way, in a way where you observe those thoughts and then kind of let them go, right? And it's been, it's been shown, it takes some practice. It's not easy to do. I'm horrible at it, okay? Um, but uh, people, they tell me when you get really good at it, um, that uh, it really does have effects on stress and, uh, and helps people to have lower levels of chronic stress. And there have been studies that have shown effects in the brain with, with mindfulness. So it's a good thing to learn about. Hey, Kevin. I wonder about uh it's attention uh, to 
activity that we do. For example, I eat while reading my computer screen yeah. versus paying attention to the consumption of the food. Just, yeah. you know, there's studies that show the effects of... Yes. This is such a cool area because... So one of my favorite studies about this, I just have to, I, like every time I tell people, tell people about this, they're like, really, that worked? There's this guy who does this study, and, uh, and basically what, what he does, he has them eat from a soup bowl, right? And they don't know it, but he's secretly refilling the bowl, <laughs> right? So they're eating, and it's not going down. And you'd be shocked how much people will eat right? As long as you keep them distracted, right? Um, and, and there's a whole field of study called eating in the absence of hunger, right? It's a way of, of testing this, right? And you'll be shocked at how many M&Ms people will eat if you get them playing a video game, right? And they're just do, 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 do. And the amount of M&Ms that they eat when they're not paying attention predicts all sorts of other things, right? So, yeah. So, um, I think this goes back to that point I was making about how we have these neural systems that evolved to sort of motivate us. They, they make certain types of foods in particular, uh, but foods generally, but certain types of foods in particular, particularly motivationally salient, right? And if we sort of make our, our executive cognition, right, focused on something else, right? If we, if we tie that up, those resources up in some other task, those systems that operate often well below sort of conscious awareness can really sort of run away with our behavior, right? So don't, what? Multitasking. Yeah, <laughs> multitasking can kill you, that's right, right. Eva. Is that a little bit like decision fatigue? Like are those similar phenomena? Yeah, that's a related phenomenon, yeah. So, so the idea is that, and, and I'll tell you the decision fatigue is a, is, has actually in recent years become a controversial topic. Yeah, it has, it has, um, uh, for reasons I won't go into, but, but basically the idea behind decision fatigue is that if you have to make a lot of decisions that involve, for example, inhibiting your behavior, then when you're not paying attention, then you're really bad at inhibiting your behavior, right? Or if you, if you, if you uh, to put it another way, if you <laughs> sort of multitask and give your brain something else to do, then your behavior will really sort of spin out and, and maybe do something that you don't want to do in terms of like eating or, or, um, or lots of other emotional responses. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. I have two questions. Something you can do to help that? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a good question. I gotta tell you, I have the same problem, right? So a lot of times it's hard for me to get my brain to shut off at night, right? Everybody has this problem. So um, there are, so to go back, maybe. Right? So these generally are pretty good rules, right? Set a sleep schedule. Go to sleep at certain times. Your body eventually will learn that that's the time to go to sleep, right? So you'll set your sort of your body's clock. Um, no tech in the bedroom, right? So, you know, try and reduce the technology. Don't go to sleep with a, uh, a television on, for example, right? Yeah, she shakes her head. She's like, no, I would never do that. Um, give yourself some time to relax before bedtime. Right. Um, related to this, actually, is it turns out it's not a good idea to do a whole lot of physical act, uh, exercise right before bedtime. Right. You want to give yourself several hours. Um, I don't know if your mom lets you drink a lot of caffeine, but caffeine keeps you awake. Right. Um, um, and things like controlling the room temperature. If the room's too cold or too hot, it's it's not ideal. So those are things you can do that might help you sort of get to sleep better. Anything else? Yeah. Thank you for your slides, by the way. They're fantastic. Because I think you must have an adolescent in your house or something. Just at least in the inner one. Um, fat. Is, are all fats equivalent when we're doing the chain leading to inflammation? I mean, because there's a lot of fat research going on that dis displaces what we used to think about fat. Yeah, yeah. So, 
Uh, no, the answer is no. So there's, there's two ways. So the question is, are all fats equal in terms of information? So let, let me be clear here. So there's two ways that actually you can interpret that question. So one is, there's different types of fats that we eat. And then another way to interpret that question is different types of fat on our bodies, right? And where the fat is. I'm guessing maybe you meant the first one? I meant the first one yeah. in the chain leading to Yeah. Uh, so the answer is no, not all types of fats are, are equal. So certain types of fat, like you know, uh, uh, saturated fats, not as good, right? They lead to, for example, um, uh, more of the changes in the gut microbiome, right? Which can lead to changes in permeability, which can lead to endotoxemia, which can lead to inflammation. Interestingly, with respect to the second sort of way of interpreting that question, um, uh, visceral fat, like fat around the visceral organs, is, is really bad, right? Um, uh, and interest, you know, it turns out that there, you know, there are actually people who actually don't look that obese, but can have uh, relatively high amounts of fat deposition around those visceral organs. And it turns out that fat is very sort of, uh, it turns over a lot, I don't mean like physically turns over, I mean it sort of changes from one type, type of fat state to another, and uh, and really throws off a lot of cytokines and is, are, is particularly bad. So visceral fat you know, on the body is, uh, is not good. And interestingly, there were some studies, I don't know the status of this but I, now, but there were some studies a few years back that showed that um, um, liposuction, particularly in women, right? So people would have liposuction to get rid of fat, right? But they would get the fat back, almost everybody who has liposuction actually gains the fat back, but it turns out they were getting the fat back and they were getting it more in the, around the viscera, right? So it was actually a long-term consequence of that, it was actually worse health, right? So something to be, you know, one more thing to worry about. <laughs> yeah? The liposuction, off it goes, why does it come here. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I don't remember the, the, like I said, it's been a few years since we looked at that. There was, uh, uh, there, were, there were reasons for it, but I can't tell you right now. I don't remember the exact details about, that's the way the, the way the body, you know, the body really works to protect its energy stores, right? Again, that's how we evolved, right? If you got energy on board, you tried to store it and hold on to it for when food wouldn't be available. And so that's the reason why it's pretty, it's not hard to put fat on, but it's pretty hard to get fat off, right? And, uh, and, and there's all sorts of systems in place so that, um, for example, when you start to lose fat, your appetite immediately goes up, right? That fights against, um, fights against it. Yeah, sure. Okay, I have another question. I know exercising is so good. Is it good to get every day or take off a day to give your body a chance to kind of Relax. Relax. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. It has a lot to do. I mean, it's something you want to talk with your doctor about, your physician about, because it depends a lot on your general health, the risk of injury, the type of exercise you're doing. But generally, they say if you can manage to do, you know, 30 minutes of exercise, you can build up to 30 minutes of exercise a day. That's a, that's a great thing. Generally, that's going to be better than... Every day, seven days a week. Um, I, I don't know. I, wouldn't, I don't know if if they would say so all seven days a week or five days a week, but generally 30 minutes most days of the week, yeah. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, sure. Is there been any more information with like the float tanks? Yeah. Did you guys see that here? I read an article yeah, about yeah. them here and that they're trying to, so when is my insurance going to cover that? Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's expensive. I do it. I would be confirmed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so for those of you that don't know, so th there's a, the guy whose office actually is right out there. His name's Justin Feinstein, and Justin's one of the one of the other PIs here at, at Liber. And uh, Justin uh, is the director of the float clinic here. So downstairs they have these really awesome, really ex exceptional uh, tanks where uh, people uh, can lie in 18 inches of water, right, in an eight foot diameter tank, and in that water there is about 2,000 pounds of Epsom salt dissolved. So the specific gravity of that water is higher than the Dead Sea. You get in and boom, you just float to the top. Right? You can't possibly sink. And, uh, and the water temperature is heated to match your skin temperature. 
and the air in the room is heated to match the water temperature. So you start to lose track of where your body is, right? You, have, you don't have to support yourself. You, when everything's right, you kind of lose track of where your arms are and your legs are. And on top of that, it's completely dark and it's completely sound attenuated. So there's no light and no sound. Now, a lot of people, when they hear this, they go, that sounds horrible, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what I said. The first time Justin told me to do, actually what I tell people is the first time, so, and, and you do this, you don't have any clothes on, right? So, because anything that touches your skin kind of breaks the spell. And Justin was describing this to me. He's like, you gotta try this, and I was like, Justin, man, I'm from Texas. We don't do that sort of thing, <laughs> right? We just don't, right? And um, But he got me to try this, and it's actually kind of amazing. It's very counterintuitive how much it quiets your brain down. And, uh, and there are studies that are actually happening here uh, at LIBOR um, to understand whether or not this potentially could be a treatment, for example, for certain types of anxiety disorders. Uh, and if you've never tried it, I, as bizarre as it might sound to you, I highly recommend it. It's actually a pretty, it can be a pretty impressive experience. So, okay, well I think we're kind of done with time, but if you have other questions, feel free to come down here and, and we can talk and thanks everybody for coming. <laughs>